Well, praise God. Bishop Enlow reporting for duty. <laughs> I've been called all kinds of things, but I'm glad that we don't depend on titles. They certainly don't mean anything. Uh, you know, Carl referred to what I said in that one of the chapters of that book, but how much religion there is, it really makes a lot out of titles and tagging people with this and that as though that really adds anything. We are what we are. Title doesn't mean anything. He's the one that needs to have all the titles. Uh, you know, we even refer to the Apostle Paul as though Apostle was a title. It really wasn't. He was not the Apostle Paul. He was Paul the Apostle. The word Apostle is simply described what he did. It wasn't some kind of title he was tagged with. But I tell you, we need to give him the praise to just be what we are and not try to try to lend dignity to ourselves with all these <laughs> human ways of doing things. But praise God. You know, are you detecting a theme in the service this morning? I certainly have had, you know, thoughts kind of percolating for the last, over the last several days. Um, I don't always uh, get to read or take time to read the uh, God Calling, but I just happened to the other day, and some of you may remember that there was a scripture that was emphasized that had to do with the love of God. And something about it just really jumped out at me. And it was taken from Romans chapter 8, very familiar passage at the end of where Paul is describing what we have in the Lord and what he's done for us and how nothing can be against us. And he basically says at the end of that passage, uh, For I am convinced, verse 38, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what an awesome thing that it is that God, God's love is the overarching thing about all that we are about. You know, you think about the many attributes of God. We think of his power and his, his omnipotence, his uh, omniscience, the fact that he knows everything. He can do everything. He's, you know, just all these awesome things. He's holy. He's, he's all of that. But when it comes right down to it, John the Apostle, when he was writing in his first epistle, he summed it up in these simple words. God is love. If you want to know more than any other single thing what God is about, it's about love. And uh, you notice when Paul enumerates the gifts of the Spirit, the, the things that should be evident in the life of somebody who is, who is indwelt by and controlled by the Spirit of God, what kind of fruit will that produce? What's the first thing? It's love, isn't it? And what was uh, the one command that Jesus gave to his disciples? You know, Moses gave a whole, you know, hundreds of them. But when it came right down to it, what was the one command that Jesus left us with? Love one another. And how do we do that? We allow him who is love to dwell in us. That's the only thing, the only factor that, that, that gives us that power. But the love of God, what an amazing truth that it is. And, uh, you know, the one who wrote that little devotional mentioned that this is the one thing that the people of the world are somehow craving and don't even realize what it is that they're craving. There's this emptiness, there's a hunger because we have, you know, we are created in the image of God, are we not? And if he's love, where does that leave us if we are separated from him and if we have become unlike him, we have become just the, his opposite, then that is going to leave one heck of a hole in our hearts. And it's the craving for being, being uh, loved, being able to love, yes, but even being loved, being valued, being thought like we're worth something. And boy, people will chase a thousand and one rainbows in this world trying desperately to scratch that itch. You know, we have the expression about someone who looks for love in all the wrong places. They've got this deep hunger, and by God, they're going to they're gonna throw caution to the wind. Anything that looks like, or anybody that looks like they're going to give them some kind of an affection, some kind of something that, that makes them feel like, hey, I'm valued by somebody, then they're going to latch on to that and, and just throw, throw caution to the wind and just get burnt time after time after time and after time again. And people's lives have been shipwrecked. 
And just this craving to be, to be loved is just, uh, it just drives people. And, you know, others will feel unloved and perhaps very much be unloved in the circumstances of their life. And their reaction is to just be filled with bitterness and anger. You know, what's wrong? What, you know, why am I so, why does nobody care? Why does nobody care about me? And so you build up this terrible anger and it just lashes out and everybody around them feels that wrath when, it, when it's stirred up just the right way. And it's even worse when they, they'll you know, look at something on TV or they'll, they'll meet somebody where there's obviously a family that cares about each other and there's a, there's a sense of community and love and they just shut up, feel shut out and feel unvalued and unloved and ugly and, and a whole lot of things that just you know, just affect, afflict so many people. But I'll tell you what, if we have one message, it's that God is love. You know, there's a place for preaching the fear of God in the sense that people ought to be, ought to take seriously their condition. And there is a deadly seriousness to the wrath of God and all of those things. And, you know, there's a time to preach that. Uh, you know, Paul even said to Timothy, save some with fear. You know, everybody's different. Their circumstances are different. I remember reading, and many of you may have as well, of the uh, ministry of Jonathan Edwards back in the 1700s. He was a man of God who was mightily used to go around and preach with a great anointing. And uh, a lot of his ministry was in New England. And you can see the effects of, of, a, of a region of a country that has turned away from all of that today. That's where I grew up. I know a lot, something about it. But I'll tell you, at that time, there was a tremendous move of God. It was called the Great Awakening. But in the middle of that, there was one community that was a stronghold of Satan, just totally resistant to what God was doing and what God was saying. They were hard. I mean, you talk about... Uh, about the gates of hell. The gates of hell were wrapped around, were surrounding that town, and boy, the people there were hard. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. God sent him in there with a very special message. Anybody remember what that message was? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. I mean, you talk about the ultimate hellfire and brimstone message, that was it. And man, when, when God, I mean, he wasn't even an impressive speaker, by all accounts. But I'll tell you, God got in it. And he stood there and he delivered those words and those people were just gripping the pews for fear of falling into hell. It became that real to them. And God broke the stronghold of that thing. But I'll tell you one thing, God didn't leave them there serving him in terror. What he follows that up with is a knowledge of who he is and his love. And he brings people to the end of themselves and causes them to turn their hearts to him. And that's what he longs for. He doesn't long for people to serve him fearfully and tremblingly in that sense. Yes, we have a respect. There is a fear that is respectful of him. That just realizes it's unthinkable to, re to reject him and to disrespect him and to just kind of do our own thing and ignore him. But oh God doesn't want us to walk on eggs. And You know, I, I met all kinds of people, I guess, in my travels and I think of one young woman that I met during one of our travels overseas. And you know, a lot of religion can actually minister a kind of false picture of God. And she had grown up among some people, and I believe there were some folks that loved the Lord, but it was all about, I mean, every gospel message you'd ever heard was this fire and brimstone stuff. Trying to scare the hell out of people instead of, Having Christ come in with his, and wrap his arms of love around them. And you could see it in her countenance. There was a fearfulness about her. She was like she had to walk on eggs. This, this remote God who was angry at sin and just was like, you know, out there to strike somebody dead who didn't line up. And there was a fearfulness about, about her. And, you know, as the Lord enabled us to be around her and, and, and give out some gospel messages while we were there, the love of Christ became the dominant theme. And you could watch her just begin to relax. And, and there was a change. And she even said, you know, I've never heard the gospel preach like this. This is wonderful. And before we were done, there was a freedom that had come into her life. You know, God wants us to, wants us to know that kind of freedom. Yeah. 
He wants us to see him not as some remote God that we just don't quite know what he wants. And if we just get the least bit out of line, he's going to hate us. And oh, my God. Oh, God wants us to come to know him as father. And, and yes, we can come to him. We, we, we're not perfect, but we, we long to be motivated by his love. We long to be more like him and we long to grow, but we also know that we're accepted. That there is a love that is that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, we as human beings, we easily come by the idea, trying to make our way through the world, many people do, that uh, in order to have love, you must be lovable. Anybody ever thought or felt that way? Well, the reason people don't love me is I'm not lovable. I must work to make myself lovable. I must, uh, you know, there's something about me that causes me not to be able to be loved. And if I, only I were different, oh God, what a horrible burden that puts on people. And particularly when you're coming, when we start projecting those human ideas onto a God whose love is not the least bit like ours. Oh my God, what an awesome thing it is. And you know, you could, you could preach on the love of God and sort of describe all his attributes. You could go through 1 Corinthians 13 and talk about how love is kind and it's, it's gentle and it believes all things. And it's, you know, all those awesome characteristics. It never fails. Uh, you know, when we, right now we have faith, love, and, and uh, faith, hope, and charity, I guess it is. Faith, faith and hope and love. Trying to remember, the, the King James throws the word charity in there. It really is love. But faith and hope. But you know, right now, faith is, is what? We have a promise in a God whose word we can't see, and we can't see his word, but we, we place our faith in that. We have our confidence in that which we cannot see, but which God has made real to us. And as long as we're in this world, we're going to be walking by faith, but one day we're going to walk by sight, aren't we? And hope has to do with an expectation of the future, which is likewise based upon the promise of a God who cannot lie. So there is a certainty about it, but it does relate to the future. But you know there's going to come a day when hope and faith will be not needed anymore. Everything will be reality. And we will be, uh, those who know Christ will be able to participate in a kingdom that has one guiding principle. It's the love of God. Can you imagine just being bathed in the kind of love that we read about and the kind we've even tasted at times? To know that as the, as the reality, the very atmosphere we breathe is to know that we are loved beyond all imagining. My God, that's the, what, what could be greater than that? God, I just pray that God will reveal it because I'm conscious as I speak words that there, there are no words that can convey something like this. God has to do it. God has to reveal to our hearts that we are loved. Otherwise, we're always going to feel like I'm shut out. Yes, God loves them because they are lovable. But me, that's a different story. Oh, God, what an awesome message. Think about what Paul has been teaching in this passage coming up to uh, chapter 8. Particularly, he's dealing with the gospel, isn't he? Now, you know, when you, when you think, let me, let me stop and, and say this. When you want to set off a beautiful diamond that is bright and white and glistening, whatever it is, uh, crystalline, I guess, and you want to set that off and make it look its best, what do you do? You put a black background behind it. You put its very polar opposite behind it, and it shy, and suddenly it becomes real. Do you know what makes the love of God real is the reality of what we are without him? That's right. And that's what the gospel is about. Praise God. Do you remember uh, a message that we preached? Oh, I guess it was about a year ago because it was just on uh, TV this past week, the last couple of weeks. And it was that message, though you were evil. I had somebody uh, write in and, and commend me for preaching that and commend the congregation for putting up with it. He said, most places you couldn't, you couldn't preach that kind of thing. But it was the truth, wasn't it? Folks, if we are going to really appreciate the love of God, we need to be able to look in the mirror and see what it is, that he, uh, the kind of person that he's loved. 
There are people out there that are so deluded, they compare themselves with other people, and they suppose that God would love them because they're good. There is none good. Man, you go, through the, you, you go through what Paul taught in the first part of this book when he's enumerating, the, when he's lay, laying out the gospel. And you see what it is and the kind of people that God loves in spite of the conditions. It's, it becomes, boy, what, what that does to the reality of his love and what it's about is just beyond words. You know, he describes how the human race plunged into darkness. It was not simple ignorance, was it? It was that what they knew of God, they rejected. They knew, looking at the creation itself, that there was a God. And they said in their hearts, they made a conscious choice. Man, the human race made a conscious choice to say, God, I'm not going to serve you. I feel all these nat natural desires in me, and that's more important to me to gratify them than it is to serve you. Get out of my mind. Get out of my life. I don't want anything to do with you. And there was such a persistence in the human race taking that line that God finally said, I'm going to turn you over. I'm going to step back. I'm going to give you what you want. And man fell into darkness. He pro men professed themselves to be wise. They became as fools, Paul said. And all kinds of corruption has resulted in that. Not just corruption, but people who glory in their corruption of every kind. And then he, then he starts to talk about the Jews and how they, uh, you know, they gloried because they had the law. They weren't like everybody else. He said, yes, you are. He said, there's no difference. You who have the law, you go around sinning anyway. Doesn't make, you a bit of, doesn't make you one bit better than all those Gentiles that you look down your nose at. God has fixed it to where every single one of us is in the same position. There is none righteous, chapter 3, no, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become to get together, become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, the way of peace. They do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, the love of God has to be seen in this context of the reality of what we are as people. You know the song, the old hymn, uh, I guess I know it under a different title. I was trying to find it this morning, but anyway, the, the opening lines, one day when heaven was filled with his praises. Remember the second line? One day when sin was as black as it could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, our example is he. That's what makes the love of God real, is the fact that he was willing to come down and do something in the face of our sinfulness and our utter unloving. Our, our, talk about being lovable. There's nothing lovable about any of us, not from God's standpoint. He didn't come here because he saw something in you and saw something in me. He saw nothing. It was not about what he found in us. It's about what he could, has the power to make out of us. It's the creative power of his love that has the power to change everything. Praise God. You know, Paul, there's not many references to love. I was noticing this. as I, I thought about this verse, you know, as a result of reading that devotional. But then I said, you know, I've, I wonder how many times Paul uses love. Where, how does that fit into his narrative about the gospel? You know, it's about one other place, and that's in chapter 5. Two other places there, I guess, but the main one is verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, love is not one of those things that you can sort of explain like you, do, like you explain sci a scientific principle. It's something you've got to see in action. Do you know how we know God, what, what love is? What does John say? How do we know what love is? He gave his son for us. It was, it was an action of, on God's part that absolutely 
came down into our space and transformed. That's how we know what love is. I'll tell you, I believe there's plenty of people here who've experienced the love of God and you know something about it and you know when you look in the mirror, you know that there's nothing you are, nothing you can do that could possibly account for the fact that he loves you. What a message we have. How, do, how it levels everything. There's not one of us who can stick his chest out and say, I'm better than you. That's why God loves me. I tell you, God is going to, God oftentimes will pick the lowest of the low just to demonstrate that it has nothing to do with that. It's all his grace and his mercy and his love. And I'll tell you, that's what, that's where we need to see the love of God. And I don't know any place you see it more than in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. You think about the religious people of their day. My God, they were all about being righteous, weren't they? And yet they had hearts that were hard and cold and uncaring. They were all about keeping the law very scrupulously, but they didn't have any love in their hearts. They, they totally missed out on the love of God. They didn't know what it was all about. And here Jesus comes. And think of the people that he reached out to. Think of the woman who came in Simon's house, took this expensive perfume that it cost something like a year's wages. It was a lot of money, whatever it was. It was expensive. You don't just go pour this out, you know, for nothing. And she took that expensive perfume and went over to Jesus, poured it all over his feet, wiped his feet with her hair. What was it that caused her to do that? She was responding to the love of God that had reached out to her. And when Simon was questioning this, Jesus reached out to him and said, and gave a, a picture about two men who each owed a lot of, owed some money. One owed a little bit, one owed a lot. And neither of them had the money to pay, and the one who, was the, uh, who owned the debt forgave them both. And he asked the question, which one of you, which one of them will love him more? And he says, I suppose the one that owed the most. He said, you've answered well. This woman, obviously, this was, a, this was one of these that had probably looked for love in all the wrong places. She had been out there trying desperately to fill that sense of emptiness, that void in her life, and it had led her to, from one sin to the next. Her life was a wreck. Nobody cared about her. Everybody thought she was dirt. And, and in Jesus, she found a love and acceptance that looked past that and was able to see the need of her heart, and she felt loved and accepted and valued in spite of her sins. And it brought her to his feet in worship. Oh God, give us such a, such a sense of what his love means to us. God, help us to, to be examples of those who have that kind of gratitude. When people come in here, they don't need to see a bunch of religious people practicing their religion. They need to see, they need to feel the love of Christ who can reach to the lowest of the low. You know the examples that we refer to so many times that you think of that woman who was brought in the very act of adultery. You know, like we've said, I don't know where they, you know, they, they managed to leave the man out of the picture. <laughs> Wasn't something she did by herself, was it? Bunch of hypocrites. But anyway, they threw this woman down there. They didn't care anything about her. They just wanted to discredit him. But he saw, of course, he saw right past what they were trying to do. But what was the bottom line when he got to the end? And he asked her, has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. What did he say? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It wasn't an indulgence. It's not, a, it's, it's not this uh, sentimental, I just love you so much, I, you can do anything you want. This was a love that's going to transform her life. That's going to turn her into a different path. She found something in him that she had never seen in any of those self-righteous religious people. Oh my God, you think about, you think about the woman at the well. I mean, here's a, here's a woman who she wasn't even part of Israel, but somehow they had enough of a moral sense about them that even she, there in a heathen situation, 
was an outcast. The hunger in her heart had driven her to seek something. Oh, I, I feel so unloved. I, if someone shows me affection, I just that maybe that's what maybe that'll sell, satisfy it. I'm going to run after that. And she ran after it, and after a while, it was obvious that wasn't right. And she'd run to somebody else, and run to somebody else, and run to somebody else, and. And obviously it wasn't long before everybody knew what she was. Everybody looked down on her. Of course, they weren't any better, were they? But she was an outcast among her own people. She needed, like everybody else, to get her water from the village well. But she was so in such a condition in the eyes of everybody that she had to go there when no one else would. She couldn't go with the other women. They'd be pointing and talking and... You know, she knew how they felt. She felt the, the emptiness and the hardness of their spirits and the condemnation. But there she met Jesus at the well. And he engaged her in conversation. And, and what made it so amazing was it, you know, first of all, she, he wasn't a woman. He was a man. That was for, for a man to just engage a woman like that in conversation. That would have, that would have been unusual enough. But he was a Jew. And everybody knew how Jews felt about Gentiles. And Samaritans, they were half-breeds. They were sort of half and half and just despised, looked down upon. A man and dealing with a Gentile woman and a fallen woman. Obviously, she wasn't there just because, well, I just need some water. This was the only time she felt like she could go. She had to just sneak out. And here's a man who engages her in conversation. And she doesn't feel that same condemnation and and, and resistance in, that she feels, that alienation that she felt from everybody else. Boy, we're sensitive, aren't we? We can feel things like that, can't we? You know, if you're in a, bunch, you're in a crowd of people and they, you know what, they, they got a really negative attitude about you, or sometimes we imagine that too. But, you know, sometimes it's really so and we feel it. She didn't feel that from him, did she? What a testament it was to the God who had sent him, that he could reach out to her with such mercy. And it wasn't that he was overlooking her sin. He told her plainly what her sin was. Oh, how, how afraid we are, to be honest. We think that if, we're, if we uncover, if we, we're honest about what we are, that that'll, that'll ruin it. You know, that's, we get that from one another. Oh, we'll put on a front with, with each other. I'm this, I'm that. And we don't dare let anybody see what, what's really going on because then they wouldn't like us anymore. Aren't you glad that it's not like that with the Lord? And who are we to put on airs with him and pretend like he doesn't know? Good grief. He knows you inside and out. He knows the ugliest thing there is about you and about me. And if we're honest, there's some pretty ugly stuff that goes through our minds and our hearts. And only someone with his character and his love could possibly reach beyond those faults. And long to wrap his arms around us. That's the gospel, folks. It's, for, it's not that God's so angry with the world and by God you better straighten up or he's going to cast you into hell. This is... God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son, only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh God, God touch our hearts with a, with a sense of what, of his love and what, what it's about. I'm almost at a loss here, just trying to, trying to feel how to put it, put it into words, but over and over again. I mean, you saw it in, in that one letter that, that Brother Carl read about that man who's now in Mexico. You think that would have been somebody high on somebody's list of prospects for the gospel? He was high on somebody's. And it was somebody in heaven who looked down and saw that man. And you know, there's people in churches today that will wind up in hell. Many, some, not all of them, obviously, but some, many of them. And there that man will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with all of his crimes and all the things that were wrong and he'll stand there and Jesus will say, come in. 
welcome, good and faithful servant. Why? Because he measured up, because he worked his way out, worked his dead off? No, because he came. What, just as I am? My word, almost everything that was said and sung this morning was just, was this theme. Just as I am. That is all the gospel is looking for, is for people to just come and say, Lord, here I am, I am helpless. Sin has got a grip on my heart and my life. I can't beat it. I can't, I can't get rid of my guilt. I can't overcome it. I just, but I need a God who will love me unconditionally. Who will do for me what I cannot do. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what, what a price that Jesus paid. You know, we are so prone when someone says something wrong to us or or does something wrong, what do we, how do we react normally? You know, we're angry. We're upset. They shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have done that. And here, all these people are supposed to even be his followers, and they, they insulted him. They did everything possible during his ministry to reject him. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. He came down to the end of his ministry, and he stood there looking over the city of Jerusalem. And he could see it there and there was something in his heart about all the rejection. He thought back over the centuries how he had reached out to them through prophets and prophets and more prophets and constantly, oh, why do you want to die? Why do you, why do you keep persisting in the way you're going? I, I love you. I would, I would wrap my arms around you. Why will you not turn your hearts to me. And now he comes to this point. And if it had been you or me, man, we would have said, I've had a belly full of this. They have insulted me for the last time. I'm going to call down fire. I'm going to rail on them with every judgment, every judgmental thing you can, th you can think of. Now, I know there's nobody here that would ever think like that or feel that. But the truth is we, every one, have that in us. You push the right buttons and, man, we are full of hell and anger. But there he was, looking at centuries and centuries of rejection and wickedness and sin in the face of his love. And what did he do? He wept. It was not anger, it was grief, it was sorrow. You look at what he did on the cross. The ultimate rejection and humiliation and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And there was a man hanging next to him who deserved what he was getting. But there was something in him that God enabled him to recognize who Jesus was in sufficient measure that he turned to him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I don't know how, it, it takes divine revelation to see, look at a man dying on a cross, being rejected by everybody, and, and, re, and say, you've got a kingdom coming. But that's, a, that's the God we have. God can touch, can, can penetrate the darkness of the darkest heart. And I'll tell you, then, then it's what happens when that heart does, what that heart does with that light. Does it say, no, I will not. I will go my own way. That's kind of what happened with the other man, wasn't it? But here's this man. And Jesus said to me today, you will be with me in paradise. You think about it. He had no opportunity to get out and serve God, to do anything, to make up for his life. His life was a, was a ruin. Everything about it was wrong, and he was getting what he deserved. And there he, there he hung, dying. And yet there's a voice of hope at that late hour that says, Today you will be with me in paradise. What a gospel we have. What a hope we have. What a savior we have. What a love God has revealed, and, and we know it so little. I, I just can't even imagine what it's going to be like to suddenly step into that atmosphere and to realize. But doesn't the Lord want us to enjoy some of that now and to, and to reckon on it and to, to learn to rest in it, to know that we're loved, not to constantly feel like, 
Oh, God, I messed up. He must not love, like me now much. Oh, his love. Well, Carl referred to it in his prayer this morning. David used the expression a number of times about God's unfailing love. What an amazing, awesome thing that it is. I thought about also Psalm 103. There's some tremendous passage, tremendous words that we have often referred to. Oh my, where, where do you start? Let's start in verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Folks, I just sense in my own heart and in my own life that we, those of us who know him, need to need to learn how to reckon on his love and on, his, on what he really is about. Yes. To see him not as some distant monarch to be, to be terrified of, but, to, but a father who loves us and who longs to just wrap his arms around us and say, I love you. Yes. And I'll tell you, those who are holding back because they think they've gone too far, or the problem is too deep, there's no such thing. There's no pit too deep. You know, Paul's testimony was that God, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But he didn't stop there, did he? He said, of whom I am the worst. God saved Paul, who counted himself as the very worst sinner on the planet. Why? Because he had not just gone out and vented his you know, his lusts, fulfilled his lusts in the, in the lust of the flesh and all that stuff. He had actually engaged his whole being in opposing God and killing those who served him. But God had a different plan. God saw that man and said, I'm going to save him. You think Paul might be just a little bit grateful after he got his eyes open? You wonder why he had such a zeal and such a passion for the Lord that had, had reached down to the lowest of the low? Yeah, Paul said, God did that to, to make me an example of what he can do. You know, down through the ages, God has done that. There have been people that you and I have, would have written off or just imagined that nobody could be like that. No, no, I mean, God wouldn't, nobody could, uh, God wouldn't be interested in somebody like that. That might be the very one that God is most interested in. You know, I don't remember the name of this man, and I, I wouldn't, wouldn't probably be sensible to say it if I did, but there was a, I've heard a number of times, reference to a rather famous mass murderer who has since come to the Lord and actually has an ongoing relationship with Brother Jim Cimbala. You know, there's a lot of preachers who are going to be in hell, but he's going to stand there as our brother one day. <laughs> and I will stand there gratefully and proudly. I don't care what he did down here. Because every one of us, at best, is a sinner saved by grace. What, a, what an amazing thing it is to see the grace of God that can turn somebody around like that and reach their hearts. Oh, praise God. I don't know. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and read that letter. I think Carl can maybe see why I wanted to be the one to read it. But this uh, the one addressed Bishop Enlow. I will, I will ignore that part. And I'll summarize parts of it. I don't, and I don't want to you know, give names and places so much. But um, he's been in prison for many years. 
And he says, about three years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, stage 4 lymphoma. And uh, he said, they say I took too long to report it, but I was trusting God still. After about six months of chemotherapy, which was worse than the cancer, I was told that the cancer had spread and I needed more chemo and also radiation. I cried, prayed, and decided to stand on the promises of God for my healing through the blood of Jesus Christ. I refused all treatment and was sent to a certain place, which was, a, I guess, an infirmary prison. Given three to six months to live, that was two years ago. Glory to Jesus. So, uh, you know, Lord knows what the, what the outcome, what the plan is. But he says, I am writing to let you know how truly blessed I am when I watch the Midnight Cry services on Sunday on the church channel. I picture myself right there with the choir, my hands also raised. And I see the joy and reality of Jesus on everyone's face. This infirmary is just a windowless concrete room, so I never know if it is rainy or sunny outside. Midnight Cry is my only fellowship. I'm grateful. I thank God for the encouragement. Because a lot of times we sit, there, sit here and feel like we're just going through motions and what good is it doing. But I'll tell you, it's not us. We have absolutely nothing. But I just pray that God will take the feeble efforts and just take and, and get his words to people that are in need. Now listen to the background. And let's see what a, what a wonderful candidate this guy is. I was raised in a New York orphanage and was kicked out at 17 years old with no family and no place to go. So on the streets of New York, I became highly involved in gangs and crime, a leader in sin. And I have spent most of my life in prisons from coast to coast, even in California, with a fellow, fellow named Manson. There I came to the knowledge of Jesus and I studied my Bible, even obtained a bachelor's degree in theology. But there is a big difference between the knowledge of God and actually knowing him personally. So upon release from prison, I was seven times far worse than the worst and under the three strikes law came back with a life sentence with no possibility of parole. The saying is sure and true and worthy of full and universal acceptance that Christ Jesus, the Messiah, came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. That's the amplified version. I was what I was. That says I was what I was, but I am not what I was. To most, a life sentence along with the diagnosis of terminal cancer would be the end, but God, the Father to the fatherless, in his great mercy, through the loving power of the Holy Spirit, embraced me. And promised to never leave me. He is faithful, even when we are faithless. There are all kinds of prisons. Mine is just a little more obvious. Born with the odds against me, I have been born again and will someday soon trade in this prison number for a crown. I live a simple existence the same day over and over with God's promises every morning, only with God's promises every morning new. Please forgive me if I took take up too much of your time. You can take all you want. <laughs> I know you were busy. I just felt in my heart to write and to tell you how much just watching your Sunday services mean to a guy the courts once called the definition of bad. Now, well, I am content to be the one who feels the pain rather than the one who causes it. God is not through with me yet. And while I serve Jesus, not time. I thank God for you, he calls me Bishop Enlow again, and all who know that Jesus is Lord. And he does request that somebody would communicate with him and give him some fellowship by communication. But I also wanted to read a couple of poems that he enclosed there. Something. He has one called Lost and Found. 
While traveling within my mind, I stopped to see what I could find in a place called Lost and Found, where lives lay scattered all around. Just as I entered through the gate, I saw the section labeled Hate, where people who are sad and lost pay in fear the highest cost. And down the road, to my dismay, I saw the games that people play, no longer needed by those few who know what greed and lies can do. Then to the right I saw the sign, Broken Hearts, and I saw mine. But on it was a tag marked Claimed, and Jesus was the buyer named. I picked my heart up off the ground and heard it sing the sweetest sound so folks could hear from miles around I once was lost but now I'm found. That's hard to even read, is it? Isn't it? Thank God for his love. These hands, these hands that now a Bible hold, once held a gun in crime so bold, from handcuffs tight there still are scars that can't be seen from behind bars. These hands so often clenched to fight have found in darkness God's sweet light. And now in Jesus' name are raised, only he is worthy to be praised. These hands that gambled, cheated, and lied, now cling to the one who for me died. His hands were nailed to Calvary's tree, for God so loved the world and me. These hands that shot drugs in my veins, now worship God, he lives and reigns. Though locked in prison I may be, God holds these hands for eternity. Pretty hard to add anything to that, isn't it? Folks, we need to just bask in God's, in the reality of God's love. Pray that God will open hearts to it. Because there's nobody who's beyond this. If only they just let go. Just let him come in and let him, let him deal with everything that's wrong. He has the power to bring people out of the lowest place that there is and to set their feet on a rock. Folks, I will stand there proudly with, with somebody like this. I won't look at him and say, well, what about all those things that you did? There's no backseat people in the kingdom of God. If you've got a past, you don't have to sit in the back row. We have the same righteousness. What was said about the exchange, we give him all the brokenness that we are and all that we have, whatever it is, and he blots it out as if it never happened and he gives us his, himself and his righteousness. That's the gospel, folks. There's times when it's right to scare people with the reality of sin and judgment to come. And I'll tell you, it's not that. that God doesn't want, to serve him, want us to serve him that way. He wants us to love him and to love one another and to drink from his love. It's real. Look what it has the power to do. And I don't know what else to say except, except to say that God's love is a reality. And if you don't know it this morning, I pray that God will make himself real to you. That it won't be just some basic thing you say, God is love, but you'll be able to say with this brother, God so loved the world and me. And if you'll let go and open up, he will change your heart forever. To him be the glory.